In September of 2012, a group of community volunteers from Burlington, Ontario, came together with their camcorders and spent some time videotaping the people, places, and happenings of the Burlington area. Here and you see the calves and the babies. So being here is a boy. You can tell by his beautiful blue, yeah, I know, his blue wings. He's a lot of that blue. Females are more of the red color all over and they're very striped. They came back with some fascinating pictures and wonderful stories. Away you go, baby. <laughs> this is our town, Burlington. Broadcast of Our Town Burlington is made possible by the generous support of the members of WNED. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patrick Okins. I uh, chose the bike path as my topic because it's near where I grew up. When I thought about what makes a community interesting and livable, it's not just spectacular places or really energetic places that make them interesting and great places to be. It's how you can see your neighbors and the people that live around where you are, and the bike path does that in a fantastic way. The thing about the bike path to know is that really it exists because of an oil pipeline. An oil pipeline had to run from Lake Erie all the way to Toronto and so this was the stretch that went through Burlington. The bike path is about seven and a half kilometers, that's about five miles long from its eastern edge at the border of the city of Burlington to Oakville all the way to downtown. It's basically just a strip of asphalt. So how are you going to make that interesting, right? But that strip of asphalt runs through neighborhoods, it crosses over some creeks, it runs by some uh, major municipal parks. There are different types of people that you see on the bike path. First there's the cyclists and there's all kinds of those. Then there's the walker and the runner. The walker is the person who is just walking, using it because it's more interesting to walk on the bike path than it is to walk um, you know, on a sidewalk along the street. There is the, um, the kid running to school with his backpack on. So you see a lot of those at certain times of the day. The dog walker. That was one of the most common things I saw. It was a person with one or two or more dogs. And that often is, is how, as it is with dog walkers, that's how people actually get to know each other on the bike path. You see a few animals on there. You know, some cottontails, rabbits, and some squirrels. One of the unexpected things about this project for me was I went there to shoot stuff to see. You're filming, and so you're quiet. So you have to listen to what's going on, too. And of course, you're in an urban environment, so you hear a lot of cars. They're a little bit more in the distance because you're not right by roads most of the time on the bike path. So all of these are sounds that you don't really get to hear. You have to really be able to step away from that and the bike path does that in a fantastic way. One of the things that make communities livable aren't necessarily the things that make them interesting to tourists or to travelers. And the bike path is a real case in point of that. But if you live there uh, in Burlington on a day-to-day -day basis, the ability to see and to connect with your neighbors, that's how you get to know the people in your community. Hello, my name is Bo Chen Han. I am 16 years old and I'm in grade 12 at Robert Bateman High School. For our town, I decided to cover our library. I came from China when I was seven. When I first came to Canada, I knew no English at all, and it was when I went into the library, it fostered my appreciation for books and for reading, and it really developed my imagination. Burlington's library is really beyond books. It offers more than the traditional magazines, CDs, DVDs, and nonfiction and fiction books. It has a wide variety of other uh, resources such as um, there's the Burlington Archives, Pedometers, Kindle Readers, you can download music from the internet, from the library website, and it offers a large variety of programs like for teens, adults, and children. Guess what Rob said, Santa Claus? What? Santa Claus 
said Max? It's time for me to go away and you to go to sleep. Children's story time, it's really exciting. You see the engagement and it's really fun to watch. For adults, um, there's a program called the One Book, One Burlington, where they choose a book every year, and the entire community comes together, reads this book, and then attends events based on this book. And this year, the book is, I've, um, it's called The Beauty of Humanity, and it's about um, Vietnam. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the celebration of our new library tonight. The Burlington Public Library recently renovated an Aldershot branch, and it's gorgeous. For a city of 170,000 people, I think six libraries is amazing. The Burlington community is uh, becoming increasingly multicultural, and the library is reflecting that. They're offering books in Hindi, Dutch, Chinese, French. So the library truly introduces you to the community that you're part of, and that's what makes it really special. Hi, my name is Greg Fairchuck and I'm a resident here in Burlington. I did a film, uh, we did our filming around um, country meets city on you know, the city of Burlington. The rural and city blended together into one seamless package is really what Burlington's about. And if you have that little bit of adventurous flair, Burlington can really give you a great experience. I had uh, my two daughters help me out doing a lot of the shots and uh, looking for the best shots that were not only through my eyes, but through their eyes, what meant Burlington meant to them. When you start to go and do the pieces we did for our town, and we're down in the downtown core, we started out, and within seven minutes, you're out in the country. Moville Park is, uh, it doesn't really do it justice, in my opinion, this time of year, because it probably has the best Norman Rockwell tobogganing hill in uh, Ontario. Uh, for pure tobogganing, it's really exciting. Burlington holds its uh, annual winter carnival there. Um, there's a great dining restaurant in Lowville at the bottom of the uh, tobogganing hill called Lowville Bistro. Excellent food, just adds to the whole ambiance. And again, a little flair out in the rural part of Burlington, things you wouldn't typically expect. We went up and saw the uh, Mount Nemo area. You're cave exploring, you're walking the trails, you're biking things they'd forgotten from a long time ago. What a unique package to have for not only yourself, but for your family. You're up on the Niagara Escarpment within seven minutes, or as I always like to equate it, you're back to a restaurant in town within 10 minutes. The girls, it was quite interesting to see them find not only new spots, but have a, have a better feeling for the city, the downtown core. We spent time at Village Square, they found, you know, they hadn't been down there in years and got all of a sudden quite excited about the shops and all the things that were there. My youngest Olivia said to me the other night as we were looking through the shots, Dad, I hadn't realized how big the city is, how vibrant the city is. We just didn't realize what we had in our own backyard. My name is Beverly Kingdon and my topic is the reintroduction of the trumpeter swans back into the province of Ontario. The trumpeter swan is the largest swan in the world. Trumpeter swans were extirpated from the province of Ontario. They haven't been here for over 200 years and we're on part of their original migration route from up near the Northwest Territories down through James Bay to the Atlantic seaboard. We are reestablishing and hopefully going to be successful in re-establishing this natural migration route. In the early 80s, there was a request for funding on the television so that the Trumpeter Swan reintroduction program could be started. I wrote a letter and I said, why don't I do more than just send money? Why don't you let me raise Trumpeter Swans for release to the wild? I got approved and I received a pair of captive Trumpeter Swans. Come on, baby, come on. From that grew in the early 80s to now when we have nearly a thousand trumpeter swans in the wild. And Burlington has the largest flock in the province. You can't go anywhere else and see 200 trumpeter swans swimming around enjoying their winter uh, migration. The first scragglers will come in around the end of October 
by about Christmas we'll have pretty well 200. <laughs> We're all anxious to get down and see who had how many signets and this is when we catch them and band them and tag them and release them again. This is an old lock-on band and it has to be removed. We now use a new lock-on band that doesn't fall off. Because we're here so much, they know us. Mm -hmm. And year after year, but when they come in without a band or a tag, they're from the wild. They've picked up with the migrating flock. So we keep track of them through these uh, wing tag numbers. You know what's interesting? When you keep these kinds of records, you can look on last year's records and it'll say so and so arrived at such and such a date and within a few days that same bird will show up with his family. And you know who they are because they're tagged. And they're so family oriented. Citizen science is very, very important. I would have never in a million years thought I would ever be so heavily involved with what I'm doing. I was a banker. I mean, and I keep teasing my friends. I say, I traded my pinstripe suit for a pair of rubber boots. We have to understand that everything doesn't last forever if you don't take care of it. I'm sure the generations before us never expected that trumpeter swans would be extirpated from Ontario. No one would ever set out to intentionally do that. And then, my goodness, they're gone. Watch out. We need the next generation to protect it and carry on. Away you go, baby. <laughs> Hello, my name is Michelle Bennett. I lived in Burlington pretty much all my life, and I'm covering some of the beautiful gardens that we have in Burlington because gardening is really a part of the culture of Burlington. The interesting thing about this topic, it's not about the house, it's right. about the property. What is special about a garden is that if you have a modest home, it doesn't matter because that garden can be so spectacular that that's what matters and the property just looks stunning. The Central Park Community Garden, uh, luckily we came across three gardeners actually who were in at the time. Cassandra is working in the demonstrative plot where everything grown is done by the volunteers and everything gets donated to our local food banks. So that's run in a victory garden method. The other gardener you see, her name's Lucy, and she was a total complete novice, scared to death. Uh, these aren't huge plots, they're seven by 12 feet, um, which is perfect for an introductory garden plot. The other gardener, her name is Gail. She had experienced gardening, but had downscaled and hadn't had the opportunity in quite a long time. This is a brand new garden on city property, and it's the only one right now, and it's in a pilot mode. We had 120 applications for 29 plots in its very first year. Everyone who did win a plot just felt like they won the garden lottery. The Royal Botanical Gardens is a keystone in Burlington for gardening. It allows volunteer opportunities, international tourists, local tourism. It's a go-to spot and we cannot actually forget their impact on land conservation. The display gardens are immaculate, they're beautiful, but they have a huge role in conserving land in the whole Coots Paradise, right from the escarpment all the way down to Burlington Bay. Burlington Central Library is a great example of how the city of Burlington is on board with beautifying Burlington. So the gardens that you see at uh, Central Library are perennial gardens, they're maintained by both city staff but also by the Hort Society and that is an important partnership. The other garden that's at a public school called Lakeshore Public School and that was a wonderful uh, partnership opportunity because it took the school eco club, a partnership with Field and Stream who provided all the plant material, Burlington Green and instead of the board just sodding it over with grass uh, we now have this wonderful teaching uh, native species garden at this public school. We just happened to chance on of a woman who had put a very gorgeous vegetable garden on her front lawn and she has a child on her back in a backpack and she's picking the cherry tomatoes, biting them in half and giving it to her little boy who's in the back who's just like devouring them. It was just wonderful to see um, this trend of 
you're growing vegetables in your front yard, the green space in Burlington absolutely matters to the people who live in Burlington. It is a part of the structure and architecture and culture of Burlington. And if we didn't have it, it would be so noticeable. And we really need to work to preserve it and keep it alive and healthy because it really does pay back to us in the end in so many ways. Hi, my name's Bronte. I'm 16 and I live in Burlington and I decided to cover the downtown area. When you get into downtown area, there's these beautiful apartment buildings that are just so well designed that makes it look very futuristic and very chic. And then when you start to get into some of the side streets, they start to become more rustic and uh, old fashioned. And the people of Burlington actually keep them up and maintain them. So it's, Burlington still has that futuristic look, but they also maintain the old side of Burlington. At the waterfront, I'm mainly focused on how there's a boardwalk, which I know my family and I like to go walking down because there's a beautiful view. And even in midday, the water is just absolutely shining. Also, it has this huge open field. Basically, you're playing with your dog or you're playing with your little cousin, and they also hold festivals there. Downtown is so much more than just a place to go and visit. It has anything for every type of person, whether it's you like art, or you just want somewhere to chill, or you're, you want to go out on the town. I didn't realize how many people and how many teenagers are actually getting involved in downtown area. It's amazing. Hi, my name is John Paulington, and my topic is the Spice Guys. Spice Guys is a group of men that we work in Burlington where we dance, and we go out to uh, nursing homes, senior centers, and then we also perform once a year at the Performing Arts. My name is John, and I'm 82. I'm Bill, I'm 78. My name is Dave, and I'm 82. My name's Tom, I'm 76. My name is John, I'm 71. I'm Rosemarie, I'm the choreographer for the Spice Guys. Age is only a number, and mine's unlisted. <laughs> I was really just into athletics and academics, and I was asked to stand in one day. And I thought, I can stand in. And it, it just went from there. And before I knew it, I was part of a dance number, and it just grew from there. I haven't stopped enjoying it since. Well, we started off in Hamilton under a different uh, group called City Lights. And then uh, Rosemary Marie, she moved to Burlington, and we moved with her and we've been doing it now 12 years now. Rosemary, she's terrific. She works hard, she has a lot of groups. She does tap, she does jazz, she does all sorts of various dancing. Some of the fellas like tap in there, but our choreographer just keeps us to jazz and we really enjoy that. <laughs> we really look forward to Fridays because then we dance, but we, it gives us a reason to get together tell stories, make up stories, and just really relax and have a great time. Uh, if it wasn't for that, I don't think any of us would be dancing. It's, it's just the fun that we have after. We work in the community, we go to the nursing homes. We try to, you know, add and donate and volunteer. Yeah, I my on the catwalk. At the shows that we do, the crowds just love us because we just, uh, we're just a little cheeky. We, uh, we dance uh, songs like I'm Too Sexy, uh, Hot Stuff, The Boys Are Back in Town. 
And the women, they are really, really generous with their applause, and we love it. Seniors are, are not just playing bingo. We're not playing just bridge. We're doing a lot. There's a lot of dancing going on. There's a lot of singing going on. And it really shows that uh, I, I think 65 is now really the 45. So, and if we keep fit, we keep our mind active, we can go forever. Hi, my name is Jane King, and I really wanted to highlight Kilbride. I grew up, born and raised in Kilbride, very small little village within the community of, of Burlington, and just such a beautiful, natural little place. Here we are on the Dakota Mill Bridge, looking over at the 12 Mile Creek, which comes from Carlisle, winds through Kilbride. Kilbride used to be a very industrious pioneer village between 1850 to 1885. And as you can see, the ruins of the Dakota Mill itself are all grown in. It was a very prosperous mill in the 1850s. We're in the Niagara Escarpment. There's a lot of nature. The Bruce Trail I find very important that runs right through our village. We're in, still independent. We have a little local school, we have a church, fire department, little police station, general store. On the family farm in Kilbride, just off of town line, one of my favorite spots. We actually have a little camp. You're certainly within reach of the city of Burlington, but yet just far enough away that you're out in the country, very peaceful, family-oriented, well-supported little community. We really want to preserve it as a village that it's not overdeveloped. It's, it's of course, very attractive in the nature part and the stillness of it, that you're out of the city and you have your own little piece of paradise. As you can see, just a quiet, beautiful spot. If you wanted to wander away from hustle and bustle, Kilbride would be the place to go. My name's Natalie Virginis, and I decided to cover the culinary experiences in Burlington. The great thing about Burlington is we have so many different restaurants and so many different kinds of restaurants. You can get totally unique, locally owned places. You can also get places that serve classics, you know, fish and chips, you know, steak and fries, but they do it so well, you really can't go wrong. Kind Food, they're an entirely vegan uh, bakery and cafe, and a lot of their food is also gluten-free, it's all vegetarian. They pride themselves on having very healthy ingredients for you, so it's whole grains and it's fresh foods and it's natural foods, and they've just become so well-known in the whole area, and they cater to a lot of specialty diets. All of their bakery foods are kosher. They're opening a bakery as a separate store because they're doing so well. And their cupcakes, again, totally vegan, totally vegetarian, gluten-free, and they are just, they are so good. Well, the Queen's Head is smack dab in the middle of downtown, and it's actually in an historic building. I think it was called the, the King's Inn. So there's some historical significance there, and it looks like a real, you know, 100% legitimate British pub inside. It's got, you know, the brass bar all around uh, where they serve the drinks. Their fish and chips are fantastic. I think that's the only thing I've ever eaten there because I just can't bring myself to, <laughs> to order anything else. Every week, one of the shops in town has a little farmer's market that comes in. This week, Spencer's on the waterfront. They had two of their chefs actually come out to the market and they did a culinary battle. So they had to select ingredients from the market. They each put together really delicious dishes. One, uh, there was a cauliflower soup that came out. There was a uh, cassoulet. There was some veal as well. Everyone got to sample it afterward. It was phenomenal. Sakai is uh, very near and dear to my heart and my family's. It's a Japanese and Korean place. When they serve you their food, it's not just a dish, it's a work of art, literally. They do sushi, they do sashimi, they do specialty rolls, and uh, they, they also do Korean cuisine. The quality of the fish that they serve and, and the way that they slice it, everything they do is just so beautifully crafted. And you can tell you're eating something that's, that they put time and, and care into making. The Downtown Bistro is a real local favorite and it is right downtown. Uh, it's in a little house that they've renovated, so it's, it's really uh, got this lovely atmosphere. It's really intimate, no more than maybe 10, 15 tables. And they do sort of a, an Italian, uh, really European style of food, so you go there to get a good, a good pasta or something like that. 
it's a real local favorite and their food is really, really good comfort food. I couldn't do a piece about Burlington food without including something sweet. We actually have a chocolate trail going on this year, which is a self-guided trail through a bunch of the uh, chocolatiers and actually businesses that offer chocolate-related services as well. There's some spas in there too. One of our favorites is uh, Mrs. B's Gift House. Uh, Angelo there is probably the nicest person you'll ever meet. I don't think I've ever walked out of there without like a free sample of his biscotti. Castellan over on Brant Street. The uh, Castellan brothers trained in Belgium and they make just these, these beautiful, absolutely artisanal quality chocolates. Then a lot of the restaurants are in on it as well. Uh, Martini House, which is actually right beside downtown Bistro. They have chocolate martinis and chocolate drinks, and then they also do chocolate desserts as well, which a lot of the restaurants are doing. I work at Tourism Burlington, which is great because I get to see all sort of the goings-on in the city, including the, the culinary goings-on. It's, it's not exactly a painful uh, part of my job. There's so many different facets to Burlington, and that it's a really unique place. It's really great because, I mean, I love Burlington. It's a great city. Hi, my name is Sydney Tilly. I'm 17 years old and I shot Mount Nemo in LaSalle for our town. LaSalle Park's not even a five minute walk from my school. It's in the Aldershot Village at the very end by the lakeshore. There's a lot of things to say about LaSalle Park, but it's just a beautiful, beautiful park to go to when the weather's nice or even when the weather's not so nice. There's just so much to see. There's Geraldo's, which is a dining hall, a waiting pool for little kids, there's a playground, there's hiking, there's a marina. There's swans and chipmunks and squirrels and ducks. I also got some footage of the hiking trails because it's a nice little trail if you just want to exercise or hike or just enjoy nature. If there's some sort of event that you need to do or just a place you want to go with your family, LaSalle's good because it, it just has everything. Like, I've had birthday parties there at the wading pool and the picnic tables and the playground. Like, there's just, there's something for everyone there. Mount Nemo is pretty close to my house in Waterdown. It's one of the mountain trails in Burlington slash Waterdown area. It's just a really beautiful, breathtaking trail. And there's there's so much to see on that trail, like some of my favorite stuff there were the birch trees. By the birch trees, there's like this really old abandoned looking building, and I thought that was cool because it looks r mysterious and it just makes you wonder what was that there for? Like why was that building there? Why was it destroyed? You get to see all of Burlington from the top of the mountain when you get there and that's just nice and there's one part of the trail you really have to walk over a cave and the cave is really cool because it's kind of gives you that sort of adventure thing. I think parks can do a lot. They're there to let the community embrace the nature of the town and they're there to let like, people socialize with each other. It kind of brings the community together in my opinion. My name is Joe Veach, and I decided that I'd like to cover a subject that I'm passionate about, which is the Burlington Senior Center. It's the hidden treasure in Burlington where seniors over 55 can meet, make friends. Once a month we have breakfast at the bistro. We call our small cafeteria the bistro, and this started uh, Three years ago, we uh, obtained a government grant and we bought two big gas stoves and uh, we put it all together and we serve about a, up to 100 breakfasts on a Saturday morning. Afterwards, they uh, go from the breakfast into the other half of the auditorium where we have some form of education or entertainment, things like that. I've done uh, men's fitness, fitness plus. There's different uh, levels of fitness, uh, you know, because like myself, I, I'm over 80 and I do the men's fitness twice a week. And it really, I uh, regret that I have to go there, but I'm happy when I come out, I feel a lot better for it. And it really is, it keeps you young. Our programs go from A to Z, not Z, Z. 
A to Z, and that is art to Zumba. And Zumba, as you probably know, is a very active form of dancing that nearly kills you. But the, the activities are there, and we have sort of four sessions a year, and people register for them. And uh, some of our programs, are, within 15 minutes of registration, are full. Come and feed those dancing feet. We have two choirs. One is a small choir that I did first, and the second one is the full choir. They perform at various functions, and especially at Christmas. Snooker is pool. Well, it's a type of pool, you know, billiard, snooker, uh, pool. And uh, we have a, a, a class there. If the ladies want to learn to play snooker, it's called Chicks with Sticks. And uh, the problem is that we teach them to play and then they beat us. <laughs> well, I don't know very much about pickleball. I went in to see it and it's played with a solid bat, just a little bigger than table tennis bat, and it's played with a ball that seems to be pierced with holes so it doesn't travel too fast. And uh, it goes back and forth a bit like tennis. Georgia. You must take the entrance. Just say the words, and we'll beat those birds down to Acapulco Bay. Apart from the normal activity, we have special events. And the brown bag picnic actually is put on by the mayor. And in the video, you'll see him joining the senior center. Show me your card. <laughs> It's a picnic out for everybody, and it's, it's very good, and good, good mixer. I think it's important to keep people active. You know, one of our great strengths is we have a vast army of volunteers, all seniors. And what happens is people get involved in doing a particular activity, and they make friends, and you know, they look forward to doing that every week. And it's fantastic. It keeps people occupied and keeps them busy. It's a home from home. I hope the people in Burlington will see that we have a jewel there, that they are welcome any time. It's their center if they're over 55. My name is Walter Bay, and for my topic, I decided to cover the golf courses of Burlington. When I thought of uh, Burlington and what brings something to Burlington, I thought of golf courses and how they are beneficial to Burlington. First of all, they add employment. Employment gives taxes, taxes help the city. Second of all, they draw people into Burlington from outside. Third of all, the golf courses themselves are attractive and beautiful. And fourth of all, with uh, the demographics being what they are and people aging, and um, golf is one of those things you can play and play and play. And I met many older or seniors out on the golf course it's not a sport that after 2021 20, you give up and you never play again. So it's a recreational sport that's beneficial to, to, to the city. They have three that are in the city itself. There's the Tyndaga Golf Course, there's the Millcroft, and uh, Burlington Golf and Country Club. They're all in what you call residential areas. Tyndaga and, and Burlington they're surrounded by the houses as opposed to the golf courses running through the neighborhoods. Millcroft runs through the neighborhood. It's, it's like a street running behind houses, which is unique. The rest of the golf courses are actually outside and are more rural. So it's uh, very interesting seeing the different type of golf courses. Lowville has a, a bit of an escarpment beside it, which adds beauty to it. Crosswinds also, you can see part of the escarpment when you're golfing there. And then you've got Hidden Lake, which I didn't know until I got there. They told me it's called Hidden Lake because there is a hidden lake not far away from it. And then Burlington Springs and Camille are also in that same area up on the escarpment. No golf course is the same. No hole is the same. I mean, it may be the same yardage, but from where you're hitting is different, from where you're looking at is different, from your sides are different. And I wanted to show that. One of the things I noticed, which not having golf for a couple of years is how friendly people are on a golf course. You get on a golf course, all of a sudden strangers you've never met. Hi, how are you doing? How's the weather? Gate, how's your game and everything? 
seems to be a relaxation for you. And I think it takes people's guards down and they're just, they're just enjoying life while they're on the golf course. My name's Paul Fitzgerald and the topic I covered is downtown Burlington. The reason why I picked downtown Burlington, I live close to downtown. Uh, my house was probably a 15 minute walk. Uh, my high school was downtown. It's a staple uh, of the community for me, a big staple. It's a safe and quaint downtown. Not too big, not too small. And as it grows, it draws in different people from different cultures. And I think that's re reflected in the makeup of downtown and what downtown has to offer. Having a vibrant downtown creates a stronger community because it becomes a hub of action. It's where people can go for coffee. It's where people can go and for Chinese food. It, people can go out for dinner. They can go for a pint of beer, a nice glass of wine, sushi. It becomes a hub for on a social sense, but at the same time too, it also helps the economy. I got a band, two guys, a drummer and a singer, playing like Jimmy Buffett kind of thing. It was an educational experience, it was a musical experience, an arts experience, and it was also a very big social experience. A lot of people who live here are well educated, have a strong commitment to community outreach. The more local people you have congregating in one area and enjoying it, and enjoying its ambiance and the feeling they get and the fun they have, creates a, a domino effect. You know, oh, there's my neighbor, oh, there's someone I work with, hello, everyone, it's very sort of, it just creates a stronger bond within the communities having a vibrant downtown. Hi, I'm Chris Hamilton, and the feature of Burlington that I've chosen to highlight is the Niagara Escarpment. I chose this topic because it's been Burlington to me ever since I was 12 years old. When I moved to London, I came back to Burlington to visit the Escarpment, to hike at Mount Nemo, because there's nothing like it anywhere else in Ontario. It's one of 16 biosphere reserves in Canada, and it's recognized under that biosphere designation with the Serengeti and the Galapagos Islands across the world. It is that special. It's a half a billion years old, and it was exposed by glaciers, and it's an ancient fossilized seabed. The escarpment contains 25% of Canada's endangered species, three different kinds of forests. The escarpment comes into Burlington in the West End, and it's mostly just houses nestled in against the escarpment. It faces the south towards the lake, so it gently slopes all the way towards the lakes. When it gets closer to the actual city itself, you start to see some parks. There are quite a number of parks. I chose three. And the first park you see, which actually has cliff faces, is Kerncliff Park on Kerns Road. Now, Kerncliff Park is an abandoned quarry that's been rehabilitated. It's a beautiful setting with a restored wetland in there. There's a boardwalk through there. And of course, the Bruce Trail runs through there. And the Bruce Trail is the longest footpath, I believe, in Canada. It runs all the way along the length of the Niagara Escarpment from Niagara Falls to Tobermory and it's about 800 kilometers long. The Bruce Trail does continue on. It carries on to the Mount Nemo Plateau. And so that's up Guelph Line in Burlington. And the parkland that's there is called the Mount Nemo Conservation Area. And that's owned and managed by Conservation Halton, one of Ontario's 36 conservation authorities. You walk in a long road up to the lookout, the Brock Harris lookout is a beautiful stone lookout which overlooks Milton and Burlington. There are trails through there where people can hike, bring their families, they can bring their dogs for walk. There's rock climbing up there, there's caves, and of course the escarpment itself is home to so many different uh, wildlife, species of wildlife, endangered species. Eastern white cedars grow along the escarpment and Mount Nemo has a few eastern white cedars that are about 800 years old. You can look north to Crawford Lake and Rattlesnake Point, which are other conservation areas just north of the city border. And of course, there's a beautiful vista that overlooks Lowville Park, which is the next park uh, I chose to talk about. Lowville Park is in a big valley carved out over thousands of years by basically Bronte Creek. 
and Brony Creek runs through there. It's one of the largest parks in Burlington. It's a wonderful spot for picnics, there's baseball diamonds, and again, a great spot to walk your dog, or come for a hike, or let the kids play. And of course, I have memories of you know, the old Toboggan Hill. It's a place where everybody used to go for tobogganing. It's just really one of the nicest parks along the escarpment in Burlington. So it's a real destination for a lot of families in Burlington to go and see. Anyone who's watching this, I'm really hoping they gain an appreciation for how special the Niagara Escarpment is. It's a place where you can go and find peace. It's a place where you can go and find quiet most days if it's not too crowded. But definitely, you can enjoy yourself in so many different ways along the escarpment and appreciate not only its beauty, but its significance as well. Hi, my name is Shannon Gillies. Um, I've lived in Burlington all my life, and for this project I decided that I wanted to cover some of the historical buildings in the city. I think our city, it's so modern right now. It's still growing, um, so much new construction, and a lot of people, that might be all they see. But if you look a little more closely, you'll see that the, there's a lot of heritage actually integrated uh, within the whole city. You could argue that the whole history of Burlington sort of revolves around Joseph Grant. Uh, he was a prominent Mohawk leader during the American Revolution and the Seven Years' War. He came to this area, he was granted over 3,000 acres of land by the British in, in exchange for his service. And he built a big house uh, right on the lake and he owned all this land around it. Eventually he sold off parcels of land and that's really how the city of Burlington came into existence as he began to sell off this land and it began to be developed. The museum that's standing there now is actually a replica of his house. So as far as I know, it looks exactly how his house looked, but it was rebuilt. The Water Street Cooker, that's the name of the restaurant it's called now. Um, upstairs, it's a restaurant called the Water Street Cooker. Down on the main floor is a bar, very popular bar, called Emma's Back Porch. But it started off as a restaurant. There was a woman named Emma Byrons, and her husband had bought it. Uh, they ran it as a restaurant from about 1919. It was called the Estaminet. And all these famous people would come. And actually, if you go to the restaurant, there's still signed registers on the wall. Prime Minister uh, John Diefenbaker, Lester B. Pearson, uh, Mickey Mantle, Liberace, Jackie Robinson, um, and like uh, all these other international dignitaries. So it's really interesting that it was such a hot spot in town and it's continued to run as a restaurant um, all this time. It has a real history in the city. It's a, it's a real landmark of that whole area which is called um, Old Lakeshore Road. Emma's Back Porch has done a, a good job of sort of paying tribute to the history by the name Emma's Back Porch is named after the, the woman who ran the restaurant, Emma Byrons. And there's actually a story that the, the whole building is still haunted by her ghost. St. Luke's Church is actually on the same street that I live on, and it's the oldest church in the city. Going back to Joseph Brandt, it was actually his daughter Elizabeth that had donated some of his land that he had uh, received from the Crown to build this church in 1834. Well, as with every church, we have to have a church mouse, and there is our church mouse. The original church was from here forward. It's beautiful. It's a little white Anglican church, quite small, and it's surrounded by a cemetery. There's so much development, new subdivisions going on all, all over southern Ontario, and I think the heritage of this city is sort of what makes it different from every other city. You know, you just don't want every place to look the same, and Burlington has a history that obviously no other city has, and so I think it's important to acknowledge that and preserve it, but while still trying to adapt. Hi, my name is Ian O'Neill, and I chose to highlight Mountsburg Conservation Area. It covers conservation of wildlife. It's got 15 different species of uh, birds of prey in this area. It's located a stone's throw from the border of Burlington. It's important to the family. We've taken our now 22-year-old daughter to Mountsburg since she was a little girl. There's a huge picnic area, and at one end of that picnic area is this viewing tower and you can get a sense of how big Mountsburg is. It's 472 hectares, or about 1,166 acres. From the viewing tower, I could see this barn. 
the great thing about it is they have a pen where people can interact with the animals and kids will take grass from around and feed them by hand and they're very tame. So on the other side of the tower is a 202 hectare or 500 acre reservoir that was created in 1966. There was a dam built on the Black Creek River to control the flow of water down to the lake and with that uh, came a lot of wetlands and after that of course wildlife showed up. All year round there's a path that will take you to a pen of bison. What are those? What are those? Those are bison. Bison. Yeah. About 30 years ago, to help conserve bison and maybe increase the population of the wild bison in North America, they created these small herds, and this is one of those herds. No visit to Moundsburg would be complete without seeing the Raptor Center. It's been in existence since 1996. Um, there is a building, uh, and inside are exhibits and a video theater that educate people on birds of prey uh, throughout the area. But the best part about it is the, uh, the wildlife walkway. And you can walk around and see enclosures that are built specifically to house birds of prey to mimic their habitat. There's also the birds of prey show, which is held in the flyway. Now the flyway is uh, a special enclosure that allows audiences to sit and watch these birds up close. Sarah showed a kestrel and it's one of the only birds of prey that you can tell the gender by sight. So being here is a boy. You can tell by his beautiful blue, yeah, I know, his blue wings, he's a lot of that blue. Females are more of the red color all over and they're very striped. I was very fortunate to have one of the staff members bring out Mouseburg's, I'd have to say, most majestic guest, and that is Pogwa, the bald eagle. This eagle was injured when she was about four months old and has been at Mountsburg for three years now. The interesting thing that I learned about this eagle is that the white head and white tail that we're so used to seeing doesn't appear until they're five years old. I really enjoyed being a part of the Our Town project because it allowed me to meet a lot of different people in my neighborhood in a city that I really enjoy. I love this city. And beyond that, I got to be a part of something that shares what I love. And I love Mountsburg. I love the animals that are at Mountsburg. I love the people who work at Mountsburg. And now I get to take that. And, and because of our town, I get to show that to other people and, and show them just how great it is. Broadcast of Our Town Burlington is made possible by the generous support of the members of WNED. Thank you.